Okay, in those early days of the new world of tequila, there are a number of tequilas on the market. Was there one or two tequilas that you think had an influence on bringing tequila to a more um, general market rather than just being Mexican or just shooting tequila? Like, as to the appreciation and understanding of tequila. Well, I'd say in terms of, of influence with other tequila makers, you know, I think there have been a couple of great influencers. You know, certainly one has to give credit, even though it wasn't commercially successful for them, to, to Luis Cheto when he owned Buda Romero. And he was the first guy to apply winemaking techniques to tequila in terms of coming out with Alteño, which was the first field designated tequila. And then, I think a lot of credit has to go to the Camarena Orozco family, the owners of, Al of La Altenia, because a lot of the things that they did came to be copied by other people. Um, for example, you know, they never trademarked Reserva de la Familia, right? They were the first people to use that, and Cuervo would eventually use that as a brand for one of their most delicious products. Uh, we know as Jose Cuervo Reserva La Familia, you know. Um, and then also distilled the proof, and they were the first to age in French oak of any sort. I mean, things that other people would eventually come to emulate and, and flat out copy. You know, obviously credits also need to be given to, to the Beckmans and Casa Cuervo for forging commercial avenues for tequila. How about people like Martin Grasso from Porfirio? You know, Martin definitely has a, a very interesting piece of, of, of history in, the, in this deal, you know. I mean, he was the first person to give tequila a value that no one had ever seen before that started to rival great scotches and great cognacs and, and great armagnacs and other, well, and like those other denominations of origin spirits. I think Martin um, can be given that marketing credit, you know, and... I mean, his packaging is really what brought tequila to the, absolutely. to the eyes of the world in many ways. I see him as a really big instigator in bringing that oh, yeah. to a more general public. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And I, I, maybe, you know, I'm sure Martin's been misunderstood in several ways, but his contribution to the growth of the tequila category is, is unprecedented. But their package was stunning. You know, originally it was the cactus bottle and a ceramic bottle for the silver, originally. Yes. Yep. And what people did Hand blown understand, bottles too, they were beautiful. Yep. yep, beautiful and stunning. And then the fact that there had been other, actually I don't know if there had been other, con I mean there were contracted mixtos. That was still the, the dominant, and still is the dominant um, category of production, but there had never really been a contracted high-end tequila, and that was what was groundbreaking because people who contracted Mixto were, were commodity brokers, guys going after the cheap wells in large Mexican chains. You know, what Martin did was, hey, we're gonna do a high-end, but I, he doesn't own a distillery, doesn't own agave, but try to find someone of, of with a good reputation. You know, well, it's like Patron. Make, they didn't own the distillery. They got the um, what's his name? The Gonzalez Fernando family yeah. from Siete Leguas. Yeah. To do that. And the bottle yeah. design from Patron was that oh, based on uh, the Don Julio bottle? It was based on a on a licorera or a special decanter that was used by both. Uh, the Gonzalez family of Siete Leguas and the Gonzalez family of Don Julio. And Patron actually took that bottle design 
and trademarked it in the United States. So then Don Julio could no longer use it, even though that was the bottle they were using in Mexico. So and would that be one of the reasons was. why Don Julio has now got new packaging? Well, or did that happen before? No. So Don Julio, when Remy Amarique imported Don Julio into the United States, they were forced to use different package. Um, and so they went to a circular bottle that was in use for many, many years. And then they finally struck a deal with Patron so that the silver and the Añejo came in a circular package and the Reposado could be in the same package that it was in Mexico. But that was, those were, you know, negotiations with big time attorneys and lots of money. And then eventually today, while well, Don Julio has a different package for each one of its five or each one of its six products. So different package for Blanco, Repo, Añejo, 70th anniversary, 1942, and Don Julio Real, which is kind of interesting. It's a lot of packages, different packages that keep on stock. <laughs> Let now, me give you a bit of details here. So we went to uh, a Giants match last night. We're here in San Francisco. And the Giants won three to two against the Padres. Yes. On a game-ending uh, base hit by Brandon Belt, I believe, in the bottom of the ninth inning. So Phil saw a game with an incredible leaping and running catch by uh, Angel Pagan. He saw one of the best double plays of the year. That was outstanding. You know, with, with the Panda, with uh, Pablo Sandoval actually getting injured on the play. He saw a solid pitching performance by Matt Bumgarner, who uh, got his 11th or 12th victory. And then a game-winning base hit. Phil, don't ever go to another baseball game. It's not <laughs> going to be that great and exciting. And we and had seats behind home plate. Yeah, yeah, it was outstanding. At uh, AT&T Stadium, it was incredible.